Welcome back to chapter 9.4, Relativity of Time. We're following the Walding textbook, which follows the Queensland Physics Service. Nice little quote there on the front there from uh, Elon Musk tweeting a quote from Albert Einstein. Two pretty smart guys. Right, last time we spoke about simultaneity. So look at this particular example here. We've got a camera on the left-hand side there and two clocks, which, if you photograph these, Will these be the same time? Will they show exactly the same time? Now, for our purposes, effectively, yeah, they will. But if we stretch the distance out between these two clocks, they won't take a photograph at exactly the same time because the light from the first clock has simply got to go that distance, whereas the other one has got to travel a lot further. Hence, they won't appear to show the same time. All right. If we put our camera here in the middle and we're equidistant from the two clocks, will they show the same time? Yes, they will, because they've got the same distance between them. That's the idea of simultaneity. In the first example, the two clocks weren't um, synchronized, they weren't happening at the same time because they were different distances that took the light to reach you. So two observers in different inertial reference frames won't agree on events happening at the same time. That's Simultaneity. So, if you consider looking at a clock and reading the time, the further away from the clock, would the clock be uh, sooner or later? It would appear to be um, later, uh, as in the time is, is a, the wrong time for you. Time's passed quicker, you look down at your clock and see it might be 10 o'clock, but you look at that clock and you might say, oh, it's actually only 9.50 on that clock. Why is it running a bit behind us? Because it takes time for that light to reach you. Okay, so it appears like time starts to slow down. So if you moved away from that clock at the speed of light, so here's your clock on the wall, here's you, and then you move away at um, the speed of light, you would be moving away at the speed those light beams are traveling at, and hence time would appear to stop for you. This is a relativistic thing, all right? To you, the time on that clock would appear to stop, and hence time outside of your frame of reference would appear to stop. But it's a relative thing. We'll come back to that a bit later. So what are we looking at? We're going to actually calculate this time dilation and how it works. Okay, we're going to look at time dilation and this term of proper time intervals so we can calculate it, and that will be what we've got to do at the end of this uh, lesson. All right, let's look at an example. Sally's riding along in a train, travelling at a velocity. She passes a train station where Sam is standing and watching the train, and Sally performs an experiment. She shines a pulse of light vertically up at the ceiling of the train where it hits a mirror and it reflects back down again. There is the emission of the light and the return of the light. Sally will see it and Sam will see it, but they are not in the same inertial reference frame, so they will see different things. So, let's set the scene first, a few little definitions for us. This T naught is proper time, and T is the relativistic time, the time in a different inertial time for an observer in a different inertial reference frame. Right, and we'll we'll discuss how we work out the difference between the two. The proper time is always going to be shorter than the relativistic time, and that's just a function of how this all works. All right, so here's uh, here's our way of example uh, of, of showing what's going on. We have on the left hand side here Sally, that's this one here, and Sam is this other one down here. So let's look at Sally's scenario. We have this source of the light here, the light beam travels up to the mirror up the top here and straight back down again. And that's Sally's clock there. We know the speed of light is constant. We know the distance it's traveling. So we can easily work out that time it takes for that beam to get to the top, to the mirror and back down again. That's a little bit different to Sam's situation because Sam is standing at the station and watching this pass by him. So to his inertial reference frame, the light beam starts here, reaches the mirror over here, and comes back to its um, the source 
back down over there, you can see that the distance that it's traveled is a lot bigger because of this forward motion. It's like uh, last time when we spoke about the cannonball falling from the top of the mast of a um, ship. The distance it's traveling is bigger because of this motion involved. So let's have a look at this. So, yeah, to Sally's time is considered to be the proper time. That's T naught. All right. You can kind of think of it as because if Sally has a clock here at the source of the light, it's the same clock. The clock doesn't necessarily appear to move or anything like that. The, the light beam travels away and comes back to it. All right, so that would be the proper time. Whereas in Sam's case, it's almost like you need this clock here at the start of the station and this clock here at the other end of the station to see that light beam and time it and, and, and have those clocks um, stationary with respect to each other and watch the light beam pass through them. So it's almost like Sam needs two clocks to measure what's going on. So he's got the relativistic time, whereas Sally on the train can have the same clock at the, that doesn't appear to move, whereas the, the events happen at that clock and the clock doesn't have to, you don't need two clocks to measure what's going on, one at the start, one at the end, like Sam does. So that's why Sally's got proper time. The light beam travels this distance D up to the roof and back again, and the velocity was the speed of light. So that's why we've got that there. Whereas the relativistic time is what Sam sees, where the light beam travels 2L over C, as in two lots of L is the distance he's traveling and still at the speed of light. So you can think about how this um, starts to come together. We've got the motion of the train, that is its velocity times its time, is the distance it's actually traveled along the bottom there. You can start to see how we use Pythagoras to put all this together. So that's that one there. And that will give us an idea of how we can work out L. Pause the video, look at how I got those equations and make sure you understand where that came from. It's just Pythagoras. Remember good old Pythagoras. This is the hypotenuse of our triangle, which is L. And this is the other two sides together. Take the square root of both sides and the square root symbol ends up over there. But make sure you know where they come from before we go on. Let's look from another point of view. We'll look at the, the equation slightly differently. So this is Sam standing on the platform watching the train go past. The light beam originates here, reaches the ceiling over there, and comes back to the bottom of the train there. So what do we know? Firstly, let's look at where these things came from. We've got this vertical distance, which is the speed of light times the proper time divided by two. So that's just um, that distance there because the light beam travels from the bottom of the train up to the roof and then back down again. So that's the divide by two part. <clears throat> so the distance is just the velocity times the time. The velocity is C. The time is our proper time, T naught. That's where that came from. That is the length of that vertical part of the triangle. Okay, remember, divide by two, because the light went up and then back down again, we only want one distance, just one of them. All right, where does this one come from? So the length along the bottom of the triangle there, velocity times time divided by two, because there is this um, relativistic time, T, the velocity of the train moving past the station and obviously half of it to get half of that um, triangle. Gives us that one there. And where does that rubbish come from? That's just simply the speed of light times the time that this whole event occurred in, but half it because we don't want both sides of the triangle. We're only wanting one of them here. This is the light traveled was CT, half of that. All right, so we can use Pythagoras to construct an equation here and solve the time. We don't just necessarily want an equation, we want a new understanding of what's actually going on here. So let's look at how we get that. 
first thing we start is with Pythagoras. So the hypotenuse squared is the other two squared and added together. See where those numbers came from? Those three went into our top equation up there. That bloke there. All right. What we've done here is because they're all divided by two, we've multiplied them by two to get rid of the uh, fractions. Have a think about what we might do next to start to rearrange this equation. This is all just algebra. All right, we've divided everything by C, the speed of light. So hence, this term simplified, this one. And when I say divided by C, I'm saying, all right, I actually mean C squared, all right, which is why we have a C squared in the bottom here now. And the C squared disappeared from the other two terms. All right, if we rearrange it and put um, the proper time on his own, and take the, the b squared over c squared times t squared onto the side we have a slightly different equation what this allows us to do is we have a t squared here and a t squared here so we can factorize this just like we did back in uh, grade 8 maths <coughs> or grade 7 maths now if we now rearrange this we can uh, work out the relativistic time just by rearranging an equation like that. So t squared equals t naught squared over one minus v squared over c squared. That's our equation for working out the relativistic time. What I mean by that is, for Sally sitting on the train, the light beam simply goes up and back down again. But for Sam sitting on the station, the light's got to travel this longer distance in the same, what appears to be the same amount of time because the events are simultaneous. But because the light's got to travel a longer distance, it can't do that because in, in the same speed because the speed is constant. So the time it takes must change. Okay? Um, it's almost like um, your velocity is displacement over time. So if this is constant, if I then change that term there, I must change this to compensate for it because the velocity of light is always going to be constant. So to Sam, the time must change to account for the fact that there's a longer distance for the light to travel. And that's what this is telling us. And that's why I said on the previous slide, you don't necessarily just want an equation, you want an understanding of what's actually going on. Because the, the length that the light beam's got to travel is far greater, what must change is the time because the velocity doesn't change. So that's our understanding. What are we going to do with this? Here's our formula. So T is the relativistic time interval. T naught is the proper time. And the velocity is the velocity of one frame relative to the other. All right. And it's usually as a fraction over C. So what does this actually tell us? This tells us that the velocity has always got to be less than the speed of light. Look at the mathematics of that equation and see if we can work out why we've said that. If this here is C, C squared divided by C squared, it's going to be one. One minus one is going to be zero. And all of a sudden our equation starts to become meaningless. The square root of zero, the time divided by the square root of zero, doesn't make sense. So that's telling us that your velocity must always be less than the speed of light. It cannot ever be the speed of light because the equation told us that. And that's what we've derived. But what this also tells us is that the relativistic time is always going to be greater than the proper time. To Sally on the train, the light's got to travel a short distance. It goes up and back down again in her proper time, T naught. But to Sam on the station, it's got to travel a longer distance. So therefore, time must be stretched for him. And his, it, to him, it appears though as though more time has passed. 
that's what that tells us there. The relativistic time is going to be greater than the proper time to account for the fact that the light's got to travel the further distance. Okay? Denominator is always less than one. All right? To make that work mathematically, the effect of this is really, really small until your velocity approaches C. That's what that little arrow means. As the velocity approaches the speed of light, that's when this starts to have an effect. You can think of this as moving clocks always run slow, but that's sort of a bit of a bit you need to consider how you actually say that. Okay, because it would appear to Sam that Sally's clock is moving past him at the station. But that's not really what's going on. That's why Bart's a bit worried there. Be careful of that interpretation. There's a big asterisk I put on that. The moving clocks always run slow. You have to understand which clock is actually the one that is experiencing the relativistic time. And usually that's the one that needs two clocks instead of one, like I mentioned before. I'll come back to that point. And this is what Einstein started thinking about. This is the actual clock that he saw um, going home in, in um, Bern in Switzerland from the Swiss patent office. And it's like he was sitting on the, the tram one day going home watching that clock. And he thought, if I sit, sit here still and look at that clock, I can see the time pass. But as I move away, I'm moving away from those light beams coming off that clock. And as I approach the speed of light, I would see that that clock appears to slow down because it's taking longer and longer periods of time for the light to reach me. But what happens if you look down at your own watch? If you look at your own watch, you would still see it as running, as running at normal time. So in your frame of reference inside the tram, your time is still passing normally. But you're looking outside of that clock outside you and it appears to be running slow. All right. So the question here is which frame is in motion and how do you describe motion? And that's what I was talking about, about using one clock versus two clocks. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, one thing that we can uh, summarize our equations is this Lorenz factor. So a Dutch physicist did some work before Einstein came along and actually worked out this part of the equation that kind of looks familiar which we call the Lorentz factor with our nice little symbol there. It's a constant, and it's a common constant used in relativity to calculate time, length, mass changes, while objects moving very, very fast. The thing, though, is that Lorentz didn't quite, although he, realized, he worked all this out, he didn't quite realise the implication of what was actually going on here. But Einstein realised the full implication of what he discovered when he came up when, and extended these equations into the theory of relativity. Notice how we've got that little extra symbol in this side here, which is often an abbreviation used. Um, the Lorentz factor pretty much doesn't do much until you start to get really, really fast. At low speeds, so less than 0.6 the speed of light, there isn't much here. You can see our graph here, it's fairly flat to that point, and at that point it really starts to increase. And that's why we don't notice things like time dilation at our everyday speeds, because we don't travel 0.60 speed of light. We travel way, way less than that. And there's a nice little table of some different um, speeds. So your normal car at 60 k's an hour, there really is nothing involved here. Um, even this space probe traveling at, what is that, 343,000 kilometers an hour, the Lorentz factor is still very, very small. But as we start to get faster, notice a lightning strike. It starts to become a little bit significant. Speed of light in optical fiber and so on until you get up to actual light where the time dilation is effectively infinite. Uh, and as I said at the top corner of that slide, this has been confirmed experimentally. So this Lorentz factor is a bit of shorthand. This bit here came out of our equation for time dilation, hence you can write it either way. It doesn't really matter which way you do it, it's just one way of doing it. But all our formulas that we'll look at for this section have that Lorentz factor in there somewhere, which is 1 over root 1 minus v squared over c squared. So let's think about this um, 
which one's doing the proper time and which one's doing the relativistic time. We've got a car here that starts, there's a clock on the car, and then there's a clock outside the car timing its motion. Here's the start point here, and the car moves along to the finish point here. And it's almost like the start and finish point pass the clock in the car, whereas outside the car, it's like you'd need a clock here at the start point and a clock here at the finish point. Hence, you need two clocks. So this is the dilated time or relativistic time. The clock in the car is experiencing proper time. It's the one clock, the finish, start and finish point past that clock, much like Sally in the train has one clock in the train, the light beam goes up and back to the clock. That is proper time. Whereas the outside that frame of reference, you need a clock at the start and at the end, like Sam did on the station, like this car on the bench, you need two clocks, one at the start, one at the end effectively, just to measure the time. That's how you know which one's proper time, which one's relativistic time. Let's look at an example here. Very fast train, traveling at 0.8 the speed of light, goes to a really long railway station. And a woman on board the train measures the time interval to go from one end of the station to the other, and she measures it at one second. If you're all standing on the platform, what is your time interval there? We have our formula, which is this one here. So now, think of it this way. The woman on the train is measuring proper time. Why? Because in her frame of reference, the start and finish events, that's the start of the platform and the end of the platform, has one clock and both of those things pass that one clock. Whereas the person on that really, really, really long platform would effectively need two clocks, one at the start of the platform and one at the end of the platform and have them both synchronized. And then you start the time when it passes the first clock at the start of the platform and you stop the time at the other end of the platform when it when it reaches that uh, the other end of the station. So hence, that is the relativistic time or the dilated time. Dilated means it's relativistic, which means it's dilated means it's going to be bigger or longer than proper time. So let's put in our numbers. Now, we were told that she was traveling at 0.8 the speed of light. That goes in there, which we've written there, and the Cs are going to cancel. Don't forget in these equations that that's squared in there. These terms up here are both squared. Don't forget that, it's a common error to make. When you plug that into your calculator, you get 1.7 seconds. As the time of recording this, I think it said 1.7 C, but it's 1.7 seconds. What does that mean? That means the woman sitting on the train takes her one second to pass from one end of the station to the other at 0.8 the speed of light. The person standing on the station will say that it took 1.7 seconds for the train to pass. That's the idea of simultaneity. That's the idea of relativity. The time period for these events is different. The woman's passing on the train, her reference frame will experience time slower. It's still the same period of time if you could stand outside all of this and look at it but a clock on the station will measure the time as 1.7 seconds a clock on the train measures only one second and there's a nice one where the authors have uh, done this on the um, oxford website you can check out so mean lifetime is something that we looked at before when we looked at 9.1 and muons where we had um, different time intervals for objects at rest and objects in motion. And in that particular scenario, we sort of looked at how the muons decayed as they entered our Earth's atmosphere and how they, the distance and time and so on were different for the, the, the muon traveling at high speed or us at rest. So you can go back and check that one out. Okay. Determine the mean lifetime of a pion, which is an elementary particle we'll get later in um, unit four. So it's traveling at 0.669 the speed of light with respect to the laboratory. Its mean lifetime at rest is 3.5 by 10 to the eight seconds. So what we want to look at is how these things are actually going to decay. We've still got the one formula. That one hasn't changed. 
So what we're asking for is the relativistic time interval because it's almost like at rest, like the woman in the train was at rest, the station was moving faster. So the, the relativistic time is what we want to find. You're given the proper time, which is the new one at rest. Um, now, and we've given the speed as well, the velocity of the, the particle. So we've got those two things which we simply plug into the equation. We're really only putting two things into the equation. Notice working in C is handy because we can just cross out the C's on the top and bottom there. All right, don't forget the squared, easy mistake to make. Plug all that into your calculator and we get 4.71 by 10 to the negative eight seconds is the relativistic time. Whereas it's mean lifetime at rest, its proper time, so to speak, is 3.5 by 10 to the negative 8. So it basically has a dilated time because of its high speed. So what we mean by that is if we're sitting here in the laboratory and we record how long this pion exists before it decays, it's 3.5 by 10 to the negative 8. But if it's travelling at 6.69, it will still appear to decay at 3.5 by 10 to the negative 8 seconds to its frame of reference, its proper time. But to us in the laboratory, watching it move that fast, it'll actually last for 4.71 by 10 to the negative 8 seconds. So it appears to last longer for us, much like our um, new one example back in 9.1. Might pay to go back and have a look over that example now that we've sort of discussed it from this point of view. All right, so check your understanding questions. Let's start to wrap this up. Which of the following is a correct consequence of the speed of light in a vacuum being the same for all observers? Have a read of those, see if you know the answers. Number two. Now, while some of those other ones may be true, such as this sort of thing here, it asks, which is a consequence of the speed of light being the same? And that's this bloke here. A clock moving relative to an observer will tick slower than a clock that is at rest in the, the observer's own frame of reference. Something that was moving at speed appears to stick slower, like the train example before. You would think that 1.7 seconds has gone past, but you watch that clock in the same 1.7 seconds, and it's only ticked one second. So time has passed slower for that frame of reference. All right, a few examples here. Can you correct these statements? Pause the video, read them, and have a look at the answers as you go. Note the differences there. The laws of physics are the same in the all inertial reference frame, and all inertial frames of reference, and the relation between the two events is assumed to have happened at the same time. Is that true? Nope. The relation between the two events depends on the position or the motion of the observer. It's always about the motion and where you're observing from. The relation between two events is assumed to happen at the same time in all inertial frames of reference, and the laws of physics are not the same in all inertial frames of reference. You immediately know that's wrong. The relation of two events depends on the position or motion of the observer. Think of the bell example in the last chat section. If you're standing between two bells at school and they go off, if you're exactly between the two bells, you hear them at the same time. If you're closer to one bell than the other, you will hear one bell before the other. There's a nice little vision site to have a look at. And there's a web link there in the um, Oxford stuff. I encourage you to go and check out. That link is that link there. And it's time to do some check your learning. All right, we've finished all that stuff. You can have a look at the chapter review after this. Make sure you do that stuff because it will help cement this stuff in your brain. Thanks for coming. The next section we have is uh, chapter 10 where we take this stuff a bit further into length contraction and start to look at some paradoxes and how things at first view, don't really appear to work out properly. Thanks a lot.